Welcome to the next entry in this retrospective into the Legacy of Kane series. Last couple of videos have been on the Pillars of Nosgoth, a key element in the series narrative, and of course, Blood Omen Legacy of Kane, the game that started it all. This time we're moving into the Crystal Dynamics era and the games that probably truly put the Legacy of Kane series on the map and made them a household name. And we're starting with Soul Reaver. Before I go on, if you liked any part of this video, please consider dropping a like, maybe share with someone you think would appreciate it, and maybe subscribe. It's free and it helps me a ton. Now, as always, timestamps in the descriptions for your navigation convenience, and the usual disclaimer. This is a deep dive into elements of the Legacy of Cain series. There will be spoilers. In addition to that, in the Blood Omen video, I made the point to judge that game and its narrative on its own merits without a connection to the rest of the series, given that it was developed by a different company altogether. That's not the case for the remaining games. Before we go into the juicy soul of it all, the game itself, let's take a look at the development history of Legacy of Cain Soul Reaver. After the release of Blood Omen, the relationship between developer Silicon Knights and their publishers Crystal Dynamics not only dissolved but got contentious. So much so that Silicon Knights took Crystal Dynamics to court alleging breach of contract of their publishing and distributing agreement for a variety of reasons, from misrepresentation in their own dealings with Activision, the company that would ultimately be the game's distributor, to attempting to block Silicon Knights from working on a sequel commissioned by Activision, to the item I mentioned the Legacy of Kane Primer, accusing Crystal Dynamics of plagiarizing their concept for Kane 2. In the end, the matter was settled privately, with Crystal Dynamics having to include Silicon Knights in the credits as the creators of Blood Omen, but still being able to develop and release new entries into the Legacy of Kane series. At the time, Amy Hennig, Seth Karras, and Arnold Ayala were working on a concert for a game called Shifter, which would have had the main gimmick of allowing players to shift between two realities, a physical world and a spiritual one. The concept was based around Paradise Lost, with an angelic theme and having Raziel as a protagonist. But before Shifter even left conceptual stage, higher ups of Crystal Dynamics requested that the game be, well, shifted to become a Legacy of Kane entry. Paradise Lost may have been the starting point, but it was only one of its inspirations. The works of T.S. Eliot and James Joyce inspired Hennig's writing, with their themes of despair and hope. Raziel's journey is heavily inspired by Gnosticism, with his journey being about knowledge, enlightenment, and the exposure of truth. Cain and Raziel both, to Hennig, are Oedipal figures. Not Freudian, but the classic Sophocles tale, both bound by fate but struggling for their free will. Blood Omen was very much Shakespearean in its prose, but for Soul Reaver, period plays like Beckett, The Lion in the Winter, and A Man for All Seasons had an influence on the dialogue style. As for the writing itself, it was Amy Hennig's first time writing a script, and she said in an interview that there was nobody else to write it and that she learned on the job and took a crack at it. Soul Reaver's development lasted for two and a half years, with only a year and a half for actual development. It used the Gex 2 engine, which was being developed as they planned out Soul Reaver, hindering some of the work of the designers, though it brought with it some technical advances that made the seamless transitions in Soul Reaver possible. Not just the shifting between realms and altering geometry, but also just steadily streaming the game data without the need for loading pauses. It means Soul Reaver was one of the first games to offer a seamless world. No levels, no breaks, you just keep going. Even the warp gates work under this concept. You just step through and find yourself in the new area. It's common nowadays, but at the time, it was quite innovative. Soul Reaver was originally slated for 1998 but suffered numerous delays until its release in 1999. In hindsight, Amy Hennig admitted they had over-designed Soul Reaver, adding too much to accomplish in the limited time frame they had. But she also feels that the game was shown to the press too early, which of course resulted in pressure to set a release date and having to do reports on progress, which, as she stated, didn't help with the team's concentration and diverted time from the production as a whole. Both Soul Reaver and its sequels would become, in a sense, battles to try to incorporate as much as possible within the limited time and resource frame. Many things were left on the cutting floor for Soul Reaver, up to and including an entirely different ending to the story, but we'll touch on that later. Music in Soul Reaver was composed primarily by Kurt Harland, lead singer for Information Society, and in fact a song from the band's Don't Be Afraid album, Ozar Midrashim, Hebrew for Treasury of Studies became the main theme for Soul Reaver. I'll admit, 
I didn't know this song was from a band. I always thought it had been composed for Soul Reaver. I discovered otherwise when I did one of the recent Legacy of Kane videos and the song got flagged for copyright very quickly. Arlen worked with Jim Hedges on the tracks, with Hedges providing programming support. You see, under Amy Hennig's direction, their tracks were made to be adaptive. They would shift based on location and situation, so each track had about five variants, along with Spectral Realm versions, all of which proved, as Harlan stated, a thorn in his side. But with that said, he ultimately felt the process was very fun, artistically speaking, and worked quite well in the end. One of the goals for Soul Reaver was to of course appeal to the same crowd that liked Blood Omen, and so the writing had to be on point, the world and its characters had to be complex, and the voice cast had to be perfect. And so, most of the cast of Blood Omen made a return, with Michael Bell joining them as Raziel. Only Paul Lukather. Vorador was absent, something Soul Reaver 2 would correct. Not only that, but the way the cast was recorded was outside the norm, with the performers recording together, acting the scenes out, unlike the more traditional voice actor where the actors record in isolation. This style of voice recording would influence the development of other titles Amy Hennig worked on, quite specifically the Uncharted series. Now, let's dive into the twists and turns of Legacy of Kane, Soul Reaver. Blood Omen gave the players a dual choice for the ending save the world or damn it. And Crystal Dynamics chose the latter for its setting, a world in which Kane had conquered everything, but the world itself was a ruin, wracked by earthquakes and other disasters, as the pillars had long since crumbled. It's a world ruled by vampires, with humanity clinging to what little hope they have, with hunters fighting the good fight. Kane built an entire fortress around the pillars and made them the literal seat of his power, a throne room on the wreck of the world and he raised six champions as his favorite sons. Raziel the Firstborn, as stated by him in the opening sequence, Turel, Duma, Rahab, Sephon, and Melkaya. Over time, as Raziel describes, they evolve, gaining new abilities and becoming less human and more divine. Or if we look at Blood Omen, becoming closer to Vorador, with sharp tridactyl claws in each hand and even their feet changing to cloven hooves. Curiously, it seems their evolution also answered to their hierarchy, with Kane changing first, and then the lieutenants following suit some time later. Which is why when Raziel evolves first, gaining wings, and making him the only one capable of flight, it's seen as a betrayal. After all, the Lake of the Dead is meant for traitors and weaklings. With any other tyrant, I would say Kane's actions were out of jealousy and vanity, but it's Kane. Things are not straightforward when it comes to Kane and Raziel's encounters with him, especially the trek through the caverns of the Oracle and its portents, proved that there was much more going on, but I'm getting ahead of myself again. Raziel is sent tumbling into the depths by Turel and Duma, and as we all know, water is deadly to vampires in Nosgoth, and the maelstrom in that lake ravages Raziel, leaving a husk of the vampire. All organs dissolved, some blue skin-like tissue stretch over the bones, the ribs poking out, his lower jaw gone, and the banner of his clan now partially fused with him, so much that he takes the other end and wraps it around his face as a scarf to partially hide the monstrous visage. And aside from the physical anguish he experienced, there was also the emotional pain and the seething rage at the hypocrisy of those he called brothers, and of his maker, who easily discarded him without a second thought, without anyone stepping in on his behalf. But even through all that, Raziel was not fully destroyed, waking up in the abyss some time later, raised into his new existence as a wraith by, apparently, the Elder God, a creature of eyes and tentacles that stretch across the world. This entity, this new master, this new Cain in a way, welcomes him to the new existence, explains what a plague vampires are on the wheel of fate, how they keep the soul stuck in the world so he's unable to spin them into the wheel again. Then he urges Raziel to avenge himself, and in the process, end Cain's empire and release all those souls. But the manual for Soul Reaver goes a little further and makes it clear that the Elder God feeds on the souls of the dead. So the continued vampiric empire means he'll eventually starve, which is of course a much more personal motivation. And from the rest of the series we know, his disgust for vampires is very personal. In game, in Soul Reaver, he makes it to be an issue of balance and the right thing to do. The fact that he feeds on souls wouldn't be outright stated until Soul Reaver 2. Now, before we move on, let's talk about the Lake of the Dead. In Blood Omen, this was a location you could visit, northwest of the Termagant Forest and Vorador's Mansion. 
In the center of the lake was a portal that took you to a forgotten city, one locked with a moon door, but only opened off nights of the full moon, and it was filled with werewolves. Its edifices having both Celtic and Aztec-like architecture and with a strong snake theme. This was referred to as the Lost City in Silicon Knight's Guide to Blood Omen, though nothing in the game names it as such. It's simply one more of the hundred secrets you can find in Blood Omen. The Lost City's architecture bears similarity to that of the ruins in the Abyss, and though the exact connection has not been stated, the going theory, expressed by artist Daniel Kabuko, is that the Elder God pulled it under, as he attempted to do with the Vampire Citadel in Defiance. The Elder God then guides Raziel out into the world, informing him of his new hunger and some of his basic abilities. The Abyss working as your tutorial zone, much like the Crypt did in Blood Omen. You learn to fight, to platform, and to feed, and at the end you shift into the material plane. In essence, the core gameplay loop. But much like King's Crypt had a couple of stages, the tutorial here then moves to the material world in a closed off area where you can properly practice the next three important aspects of the gameplay. The first, dealing with vampires, their strengths and their weaknesses. Also, the consequence of receiving lethal damage in the material world. And lastly, and the point of contention for most players when Soul Reaver released, pushing boxes. Raziel pushes more boxes, blocks and crates than Lara Croft did in the entire original Tomb Raider trilogy. Raziel is shocked to discover the vampires before him are the children of Dumas, in other words, the Dumahim. He claims the wretches couldn't be part of their high bloodline. Raziel still carries his pride as a member of King's Council and their noble blood, while the Elder Guard points out that much has changed since he was executed. With the tutorial complete, you head out and reach the outer walls of the Sanctuary of the Clans, the fortress built around the pillars, and here comes the big reveal for Raziel. This is not the same time period as we saw in the intro. Centuries have passed since then, and in the time, Nosgoth has degraded even further. And not just the world, but even vampire bloodlines have regressed, becoming far more monstrous than they used to be. For the player, that's the second thing that's immediately clear, but only for those who play Blood Omen, is that the map you're working with is much, much smaller. The distance between the Lake of the Dead and the pillars in Soul Reaver is a hop, skip, and ruined wing glide away, whereas in Kane's Adventure, it would have taken and far longer. And this compression of the world map will only become much more apparent if you add the caverns of the Oracle to the mix. While in a way it is regrettable that so little of Nosgoth is explorable, the map is tight and going from one area to the next is fairly quick, so you're never in a lull where you're just walking from one point to the next. Instead you pass from one area of interest to the other helping with not only the pace of the story but that of gameplay and keeping things exciting, especially with the rather Metroid-like quality of Soul Reaver with abilities opening up areas for exploration and secret power-ups. If the world had been bigger, going back to the different locales would have been much more of a chore, even with the warp gates. This Nosgoth is definitely not the same as Blood Omens, but I can only surmise that it's because the team developing Soul Reaver had two goals. One, appeal to the Blood Omen fan, but much more importantly, appeal to everyone else. And thus, a tight map is more important than one that is Blood Omen lore accurate. First stop for Raziel in this new era is his own domain, and when he reaches it, he is shocked and outraged to discover his own bloodline had been eradicated, wiped from the map by the other clans. Resolved to confront Malkaia and make him the first to pay, Raziel delves into the necropolis. He finds members of Melkaia's brood and sees they have also devolved, becoming weak and frail and almost zombie-like. Melkaim vampires are the weakest of the bunch, and become stunned and ready to be dispatched within a couple of hits. They're the perfect fodder for the first dungeon. The trek to Melkaia's sanctum deep in the necropolis has some night platforming sections, including jumping over water, which at this point is still deadly. But Soul Reaver already had its retry mechanic in place with the spirit realm. It's very difficult to die in the spirit world, something that would change drastically in Soul Reaver 2. But that's a topic for another video. Not only that, but this journey also teaches you to think in two dimensions, not 2D, but in two realms, to realize that if the path is not available to you right away, then maybe what you need to do is go spectral. And the way Soul Reaver introduces this to you is a room where shifting to spectral not only warps existing objects, but even makes others jut out of the walls, creating platforms that weren't there before, not to mention stopping all physics. Objects do not move in the spectral realm, they stop dead, no pun intended. Raziel's description of Melkaia states 
that he was the last one created by Cain, and thus got a meager portion of his gift, his soul essentially. And this caused him to be frail, in a way, and that his offspring, as I said before, are just as weak. But what the games leave out is something that the game manual clears up, because soul reverts from a time where we still had those. Melchiah's flesh was constantly rotting, the skin just mottled and falling away, so he, and by extension his brood, would skin their victims and wear them. And he's described as vain and constantly hunting for the most beautiful subjects to take on. I suppose the corpses we see them feeding on with exposed bones are meant to represent this, but it's unclear. Soul Reaver really fails to convey the nature of Melchiah's devolution. When you do meet him, he's a lumbering mass of warped flesh, with myriad faces across his body. Artist Daniel Kabuko stated in an interview that the reason for this is that as time passed, Melchiah began to graft the bodies of his victims to himself in his eyes, remaking his form as he saw fit. His ability to pass through gates and grates and other such barriers, meaning his massive form could move unimpeded. Melchiah's form was also something of an inside joke in Crystal Dynamics, as the faces we see attached to him are in fact company employees. As for the devolution itself, it's because of Cain's corruption. From way before the beginning of Blood Omen, when at birth, he was struck by the same corrupting influence Nopropter unleashed upon the Circle of Nine. This was confirmed in a series of Q&As by members of the Defiance team. Those created first were have retained much more of a human appearance, as evidenced by Dumas. Raziel, presumably, would also have been like this, and of course, Turel who despite having a monstrous appearance in Defiance, was originally planned to be in Soul Reaver, where he would have looked much like the Turalim encounter in several areas of the game. Melchiah and Seven are the bottom of the barrel, and as such their appearance is the most warped. Raziel demands answers from Melchiah, specifically on what happened to Raziel's clan, his own children. Melchiah offers a vague answer, only revealing that Raziel is the last of his bloodline. And with the phrase, you are the last to die, the boss fight kicks off. Interestingly, the voice tracks for all of the lieutenants were altered in post-production. Melchiah is voiced by Michael Bell. So this confrontation between Raziel and Melchiah is, essentially, Michael Bell arguing with himself. Melchiah sets the tone for what boss fights will be for most of the game. They've a couple of exceptions, bosses in Soul Reavers are yet another puzzle to solve, in how to use the environment against the brothers to exploit some vulnerability. In Melchiah's case, that being his shambling speed, and the fact that he can phase through only barriers that he's aware of, if he can see them or touch them. So the trick is to raise spike gates and drop them when he's crossing the threshold, when they're right above him. It's a simple design, not much in the way of complexity, and Melchiah simply walks. He really doesn't do anything. Perhaps he has attacks if it catches up to you, but you would have to sit still for a while to let that happen, meaning the boss itself is something of a tutorial. He is to boss fights while the two starting Doom of him are to regular combat, with three spikes piercing through him, a lever unlocks for a central grinder. Luring Melchiah in, Raziel crushes his brother's body, but not before demanding to know where Cain is, only to learn that Cain appears when it suits him, he can't be summoned. Melchiah's death releases his soul, and Raziel absorbs in a sequence that is very reminiscent of Highlander. It's a big spectacle of light and magic, and Raziel acquires a new ability, a portion of Melchiah's gift of phasing, because it only works in the spectral realm. With it, the way is now open to the sanctuary of the clans, the seat of the empire and home to the pillars of Noskoth, or their ruin anyway. But something else is now open to Raziel. In the necropolis, a path to a room with three pillars and a stone face with metal eyelets set on a wall. By toppling the pillars, the eyes open and energy concentrates on the spot the pillars collapsed on, revealing the first of the glyphs, the optional powers or spells that Raziel has access to, which were, during development, only part of a whole suite of abilities that Raziel could unlock, with glyphs matched by different elemental properties the Reaver could be imbued with. Only a single one of these matching pairs remains, in the form of the Fire Reaver and Fire Glyph. An entire glyph didn't even make it into Soul Reaver, as it was tied to the original planned plot. The first glyph is the Force Glyph, a repel-like effect that throws enemies away, as if Raziel had picked them up and thrown them, meaning the power could be used to send enemies into hazards. Being optional, you can go through all of Soul Reaver without ever seeing one of these glyph shrines. The original plan, though, was for them to have a much stronger presence in the narrative. Breaking into the sanctuary of the clans with his new ability, Raziel comes face to face with his killer, Kane and demands answers for what happened to his clan, with Cain flippantly telling him that what he created he can also unmake, 
Raziel is understandably outraged, shouting at Cain how this genocidal act against Raziel's clan is unconscionable. Cain makes it clear that only one Raziel can understand the weight on Cain's shoulders, the centuries of doubt and regret born from his choices, will he be able to question Cain's judgment. When asked what he would do in his former master's place, Raziel claims he would act with integrity. Raziel's outrage is very interesting because on the one hand, he's correct. Eradicating his clan, destroying his bloodline, is an utterly evil thing to do. But yet, on his journey, he witnesses innocent humans being attacked and killed and never moves to help them and more than once makes claims of the nobility of the vampiric bloodlines of Cain's Chosen. Humans are just beneath his notice. After all, Soul Weaver's manual clearly states that Cain's sanctuary was built by the hands of enslaved humans, and by the time they built it, they had domesticated the human species. So in the end, there's a degree of hypocrisy in Raziel's moralistic outrage. In truth, it's not the act that angers him so, not the morality of it. It's the fact that it was done to his skin, his blood, his clan. Before the battle begins, Cain comments on the state of the Empire and says, this place has outlasted its usefulness. And at first glance, you could think it means the throne room, the pillars, the sanctuary itself. But given Kane's actions in this game and beyond, he's clearly speaking of this time period, this version of Nosgoth, which is why his endgame is to abandon it for the past, where he may be able to change things. One wonderful bit of storytelling here is that when Cain draws the Soul Reaver, Raziel comments on how they all knew that when Cain drew the blade in anger, it meant someone was going to die. And despite his anger, despite his outrage, he actually takes a step back. The fear of the blade, instilled in him as a one of the lieutenants, is still very much there. The Cain fights are an example of those boss fights that are just straight up combat, not puzzles. And they follow the three hit and it's dead boss design that was very much prevalent in this gaming generation. With the third hit, the battle ends and King channels the powers of the Reaver to subdue Raziel and then strikes him directly with it, only for the blade to shatter. Kane isn't surprised though. In fact, he states, The blade is vanquished. So it unfolds. And we are a step closer to our destinies. Meaning, he was counting on it, much like he counted on Raziel's resurrection and return, which is one of the hints the narrative gives you that Cain is very much in control here. This is his game of chess, and for all his bravado and thirst for vengeance, Raziel is still very much a pawn. But with its physical form shattered, the spiritual aspect of the Soul Reaver is released and binds itself to Raziel. Soul Reaver and Reaver of Souls bound together forever. At this point, we're a long journey away from discovering the two are one and the same. With Cain gone, the pillar's oldest tenant makes an appearance, Ariel, former guardian of balance, trapped here for more than a thousand years, seeing the world continue to move on and decay. She assumes Raziel is yet another creation of Cain's, meant to torture or mock her in a way, but Raziel reassures her that he's not Cain's ally and asks how she came to haunt the pillars, at which point Ariel gives a quick summary of the end of Blood Omen. Cain refused the sacrifice, she says, before deciding to help Raziel with hints. After all, she's been around for a long time and knows a lot. In truth, she more or less says the same lines the other god tells you to guide you to the next objective. Not only that, but the writing on this cutscene is very odd. Ariel asks who and what you are, and at no point does Raziel introduce himself, yet Ariel calls him by his name when offering her services as Hint's system. Then we share a common foe, Raziel. Return here when you have need. Ariel remembers what others have forgotten. Sure, she's always there and could know Raziel from his previous incarnation as a vampire, and could even have heard Raziel and Cain talking before their battle. But if you consider that, then why does she ask if Raziel was there to torment her? What I'm saying is the dialogue in this cutscene is poorly written. With a soul reaver in hand, the way opens, literally. There is a door that opens by using the reaver as key, something that is only done once or twice in this game, but will become prevalent in the sequels. Nevertheless, the next brother to hunt is Sephon, the second to last lieutenant to be created, and the master of the silent cathedral. This edifice was once a weapon created by humans, housing an enormous organ, the sound coming from its pipes powerful enough to destroy all vampires in the vicinity. But after Sephon and his brood took over, as the name suggests, the weapon has fallen silent. The silent cathedral is the most puzzle-heavy section of Soul Reaver, with multiple rooms full of boxes to flip and push, levers to pull, and shifts to the spectral realm to stop things from moving. 
not to mention tons of fences and such to face through, all while dealing with the ultra-aggressive Sephardim vampires, who all have stocky bodies but spindly limbs and have arachnid abilities. Not only that, but the cathedral's puzzle rooms have one of the few instances of enemy respawn mechanics. If you take too long to solve them, the spider vamps show up. And yes, I'd said spider vamps. It fits, you know it fits. I even have a little song for them. Spider vamp, spider vamp, does whatever a spider can. Spins a web, any size. Beats on humans, just like flies. Look out, here come the spider vamps. Sorry, had to do that. Compared to the more open area vibe of the necropolis, the cathedral is very much a collection of hallways, and the goal is to patch up and reactivate some of the piping, and air flowing through them to reach the highest point in the cathedral where Sephon is waiting. But there is a curious thing about the cathedral. It's a minor thing, but it is a bit of that immersive role playing that Blood Omen had, but it was up to you how violent, deadly, or uncaring for humanity Cain was on his journey for vengeance. There is a room in the cathedral where you'll find a solitary human hunter. He doesn't attack you on sight. You can very much offer him the same courtesy or you can kill him. He will die in one hit. If you spare him, then if you visit the human citadel, then the humans there will see you as an ally and as an avenging angel, someone on their side, with some of the people even dropping to their knees in worship of you. But I'll go over the human citadel a bit later. Time has been as kind to Sephon as it was to Melchiah. He's warped and insect-like, skin replaced by a tough carapace, and though his face appears humanoid at first glance, the eyes and lower jaw can separate from the head like plates to reveal a maw full of sharp teeth. His body encompasses the entire room, with spear-like legs hanging from the ceiling and much like a mantis, having razor-sharp blades or arms. With that said, the upper body still has something of a humanoid form, though the lower half is very much an egg-sack or spawning more of his brood. He's nasty, that's what I'm saying. Really, really, just truly off-putting. Zephon boasts to Raziel how he took the cathedral and how the entire edifice has now become his body. But Raziel is not impressed and retorts that Zephon has merely found a crevice to hide in like a coward, only feeding on those who are already trapped in his web, but that he made a mistake in letting Raziel get so close, for now it's Zephon's turn to fall. The vampire responds that with his growth, his appetite has grown as well. So he calls us a little morsel and bids him to step forward. And I love that line, because I see it as such a wonderful variation of the first line of the classic poem, The Spider and the Fly by Mary Howitt, which is, Will you walk into my parlor? said the spider to the fly. Though you've probably heard it misquoted as, Step into my parlor, which is closer to what Stefan says. Much like Melchiah, this is a puzzle fight but it does have some combat elements in it. You have to bait an attack from the big limbs on the ceiling, and when they strike, they become stuck in place, giving you time to destroy them. The pain, I suppose, makes Seven spit out an egg out of pure reflex, and the next step is to pick up the egg and take it to the conveniently placed dead hunter with the still-lit flamethrower near the entrance of the room. You light that baby on fire, literally, and chuck it at its mama, and after a few throws, Seven is defeated and his soul devoured. But in a rather unique situation, and unlike every other boss brother, Stefan's body doesn't disappear. He remains where he is, just as soulless as he is lifeless. Stefan's soul gives Raziel the ability to climb certain grooved walls, and immediately outside of his chamber is one of those walls which can be used to open up some of the top pipes of that giant organ the cathedral supposedly is, and you get a great cutscene where the sound immediately kills the two Stefanim in the room, and in fact they don't respawn again. With the climbing acquired, Raziel is directed towards a path newly opened by Nosgoth's earthquakes, one that reveals an ancient crime, or so the Elder God claims. But before that, by revisiting the necropolis, it's possible to now enter a secret area that is one of the very few real connections this Nosgoth has to Blood Omen, Nopropter's Retreat. Or a fraction of it, really. It's merely the skull ship balcony or outlook, most of it broken off a long time before, and resting on the floor, with a glyph to be found in the vicinity. Unfortunately, there really isn't much in this secret area that reminds you of the retreat as it appears in Blood Omen, and Raziel doesn't even comment on it. Would have been great to see him comment on the prompter. After all, Raziel has things to say about Mobius when he reaches the chamber of the Oracle, and even mentions that Cain told them of his exploits, 
so surely Raziel must know about the other members of the Circle of Nine. But no, in this regard and many others, the connections between Soul Reaver and Blood Omen, particularly in terms of Nosgoth, are very tenuous. This is especially true when looking closer at the stained glass window in the retreat, which has religious, and by religious I mean Catholic imagery, or something close to it, with a figure in the center that looks very much like Jesus. And we can all agree that's a bit weird for Nosgoth. Raziel heads back to the pillars and with his new skill, can reach a new area, a dilapidated chapel, maybe in a fortress. Raziel recognizes it as a seraphim edifice and gives a brief description of the warrior priests. How in the times of Vorador, before Cain's rebirth as a vampire, the Seraphan, full of righteous fury, murdered vampires by the score, eliminating entire bloodlines in decades, and here was one of their tombs. Murderers enshrined, he says. Raziel's disdain and disgust for the Seraphan is apparent, which is consistent with the way he's behaved so far. He has lofty views on vampire kind. Let me remind you of his comments when you see the first of Dumahim. These foul scuttling beasts could not be kin of our high blood. Stepping inside, the Elder God offers a warning that inside are secrets that may inform Raziel but may also destroy him. And that secret is the tomb of Seraphim warriors. Caskets open and empty, save for one which only has an inscription on the wall, but no matching coffin. Malik. For his remains would have been in his fortress, set upon a sad, lonely throne, dust perhaps, by this time period. But more importantly, the names on the other coffins are Turel, Rahab, Duma, Melkaya, Sephon, and Raziel. And here our Soul Reaver discovers his origin, that he was once a Seraphim warrior, a knight in the cause of vampire slaying, and realizes the sick perverted joke of Cain raising these men to be the thing they hated most. Raziel is struck by a sudden pang of remorse at having spilled the blood of his brothers calling them comrades in arms, whose tombs had been desecrated much like his. And here we see the sudden turn in attitude towards the Seraphim by Raziel, which would carry on well beyond this game until the final acts of the sequel. But much like the outrage at the death of his clan, this nostalgia and sudden change in perspective are not moral in nature. It's not about good or evil, it's self-centered. As Raziel takes it as yet another thing that was taken from him by Cain, Minutes before, he dismissed them as murderers. But now that he's one of them, surely they have to be the good guys. Just another hint that Raziel is deluded in thinking he's the hero of his story. Shifting to the spectral realm opens the very floor beneath Raziel, dropping him into a chamber that is very much built like a small boss arena, with a square area surrounded by water. Stomping in this area is the first Turlim vampire we meet, known only as the Tomb Guardian but commonly referred to by its production name, Morlock. The dialogue was originally part of the confrontation with Raziel's brother Turel, but adapted to the Tomb Guardian when Turel got cut from Soul Reaver. The Turelim do remain and are the most dangerous vampires you fight in the game, having both strength and speed and also a telekinetic projectile attack, and they do so love to snipe you out of the air. This Turelim in particular is also a wraith, an enemy introduced early on in the game is the Vampire Wraith. What happens when a vampire's soul remains too long in the underworld without being consumed? It adapts and becomes a soul-stealing creature, much like Raziel. If they manage to re-inhabit their bodies, they bring that hunger across, becoming soul-devouring vampires. Several of them are fought across the game, and other than having the same drain attack of the Wraith, they're very much regular vampires. This is supposed to be a boss fight, but really it's just a normal enemy with an intro sequence. But the conversation is interesting, as the Guardian orders Raziel to leave, branding him a heretic. And it's this word that is interesting, because it's a callback to the game's intro to the first sentence spoken by Raziel. Cain is deified. There are those in the Empire that truly worship Cain. With the Guardian dispatched, a relic appears. Which is yet another way this encounter differs from other boss fights. It's not a soul you're consuming, but the Guardian's death just makes the relic appear, which grants you the ability to fire the same telekinetic projectiles as the Turelim. And I suppose it's a way to give you the ability of Turel's brood without Turel being there himself. So it's not a soul you absorb, but an item, protected by this Guardian along with the tomb itself. Just another one of his responsibilities, I suppose. The Tomb Guardian fight changed many times during production. At one point, it would have been a Melkahim vampire instead of Turulim. 
and in other versions the soul reaver blade came with a projectile ability and consuming the soul of the guardian would have granted the power to raziel as well to use without the reaver with the new power raziel makes it out of the tomb and his journey takes him immediately to the lair of the next brother Rahab, whose bloodline has become much more sensitive to sunlight but has managed to overcome the species aversion to water, becoming a mermaid vampire hybrid. A uh, merpire. Yeah, merpire. That works. This is the Drowned Abbey, an old monastery that is mostly underwater, meaning, of course, its layout consists primarily of perilous platforming above water, with a plunge sending you straight into the spectral realm, automatically making it the most annoying of all of Soul Reaver's areas. Because despite the best intentions, platforming in Soul Reaver can be inaccurate and janky, with Raziel oftentimes failing to grasp the edge of platforms and just falling straight down. The Drowned Abbey is also a step down in complexity in terms of locations. It's very straightforward, with only a couple of rooms that if you don't notice where you need to go, you can end up running in circles. But if not, it's very much a linear path to the boss arena. There aren't even puzzles to solve. It's very much the platforming level. And if the platforming in the area wasn't enough, the boss fight is truly heinous. Particularly because it requires a skill that the game fails to explain. When you acquire the projectile ability, the prompt is only for hold button to charge and release to shoot. But it doesn't teach you to enter free aim mode, which is what you need to defeat Wahab. I can only imagine that they expected you to go to the manual and learn the controls for that. But if you didn't, or if you're playing it now, it can be a source of frustration. Rahab's cutscene is short, but it's key because we can see in it how Raziel is now clearly shifting in attitude towards the Seraphan, as he asks Rahab if he knew that Cain had desecrated their tomb and turned Seraphan warriors into vampires. Rahab's reply is to not only dismiss this, but also reinforcing the idea that Cain is worshipped in some parts of the Empire. As Rahab questions if it even matters, after all, they were lost, and Cain saved them from themselves. Rahab even explains that Cain had visited him and told him of Raziel's visit, and that it would mean his demise. To which Raziel asks, You speak with the murderer? Only for Rahab to chastise him, You would do well to mind your blasphemous tongue. Rahab's appearance is also interesting, in that while it's known for a fact that Raziel and Turel were the first and second lieutenants, and Sephon and Melkaya the last ones, the order between Duma and Rahab is unclear. But given their different power levels, Duma is generally accepted to be the third, with Rahab the fourth. And when you look at the lieutenants in this time period, Rahab is something of the sweet spot between adopting a monstrous visage and still having some remnants of the humanoid shape. He's very much amphibian, but still closer to human than Melkaya and Sephon, who have become full-on monsters. The boss fight is about using the projectiles to break stained glass windows. Once all of them are gone, sunlight pierces the chamber and Rahab is undone, his soul granting you, as you might have guessed, the immunity to water and the ability to swim, meaning it's possible to explore a fair amount of Nosgoth and collect glyphs and other upgrades, with a matching pair of Fire Glyph and Fire Reaver in this same area. And while the next place I'll talk about can be visited right after obtaining the climb ability, I personally visit it after Rahab's soul has been obtained, as it means I can acquire everything I need without having to do return trips. This is the human citadel, the last remaining bastion of humanity, reachable through a waterlocked area accessible from the Lake of the Dead. There isn't much to the human citadel. Most of the content for it is related to Soul Reaver's original plot, which I'll cover later. And with all of it cut or altered in production, it's a leftover. You can still visit it for some health upgrades and a glyph, but that's about it. But the Citadel does offer something interesting. Remember I mentioned the Lone Hunter in Sephon's Cathedral? How sparing him will make the humans see you as an ally? If you killed him, then the Hunters are hostile and the civilians flee. But not forever. It's such a shame that this place became optional. Because if you behave yourself, then on the next visit, they'll trust you. And they're your allies, you can actually feed on humans without having to kill them, with Raziel taking a sip from the wrist, as if it were blood like a vampire. I am very curious as to how this trust could have had a bigger part in the narrative. With Rahab slain, the Elder God directs Raziel across the chasm in the Lake of the Dead into the cold regions of Noskoth, to a small fortress where Dumas made his home and then his last stand. The ground is littered with the bodies of his skin, and the Elder God explains that as Dumas grew in power, he and his brood also grew arrogant and thought themselves invincible. 
but they weren't ready when a well-executed human assault came. Most died, including, apparently, Dumas. The fortress is mostly desolate, with the exception of a handful of Dumahim vampires and one or two vampire wraiths in the spectral realm. But if we consider the different areas each boss occupies as a dungeon, in a traditional adventuring and role-playing sense, then Dumas' dungeon is the smallest and most straightforward, and that's even considering what I've said about the Drowned Abbey. Doesn't mean there aren't puzzles, but they're fairly simple, with the last one consisting of jumping between platforms, then shifting back and forth, then jumping down a hole to push an obelisk. Compared to the necropolis in the silent cathedral, it's fairly disappointing and a testament to how much of a rush job Soul Reaver turned into. I'll admit this is mostly my opinion, as I've not been able to find any evidence that there were other plans for the Dumahim city, but considering the design of other areas, including the one that comes right after this section, and the fact that in an interview Daniel Kabuko stated that they very much looked at their plan and started cutting things off, and Amy Hennig confirming they removed about a silent cathedral's chunk of content from Soul Reaver, including bosses, puzzles, and more, then there's a good chance that some of the complexity in this section may have been cut out as well. By toppling the aforementioned obelisk, you open the path to the throne room, decorated with a red carpet leading to the throne and two massive statues of Raziel's brother on each side. On the throne sits the man himself, with multiple spears spinning him in place. Much like it happens with every other impaled vampire found throughout Nosgoth, Duma awakens. He thanks Raziel for his aid, but the wraith replies that the thanks are premature, that he remembers who threw him into the abyss. Dumas claims his power has grown through his stay in Limbo, that now not even Cain is his match, to which Raziel retorts that every vampire has a weakness, and that his thirst has now been replaced by another hunger, promising to devour Dumas's soul before the day ends. Now, if the player should shift to the spectral realm before freeing Dumas, a different cutscene plays, as Dumas is present in the spectral realm as well. And you can start the boss fight here. The difference is, Dumas is actually invincible in the spectral realm, as the only means of killing him is by luring him into the furnace and blasting him to bits. A funny story from the development is that Dumas' boss design, having to lead him towards the furnace, essentially a cat and mouse chase, terrified the testers. They were very much intimidated by having this hulking, gigantic, armored vampire stomping behind them. To be honest, I had the same feeling when I played the game the first time. This guy terrified me. With Dumas destroyed in the flames, the last ability in Soul Reaver is unlocked, and it's by far the worst ability in any of the Legacy of Cain titles, and that's including Blood Omen 2, Constrict. A power that only activates after running around the target in a circle. It's fairly useless against enemies. Most of them won't sit still while you do rings around the rosy, and it's used to turn clearly marked objects for different puzzles in the last area. In fact, I suspect some of the puzzles in the caverns of the Oracle, including the one to open the main entrance, were added simply to give usefulness to Constrict. It's horrendously bad. But that is actually the final area of Soul Reaver, the caverns of the Oracle of Noskoth the third major landmark from Blood Omen seen in Soul Reaver. Fourth, if you count Proptor's Retreat, which is very much optional. The other two are, of course, the Lake of the Dead and the Pillars. The caverns are puzzle-heavy, much like the Silent Cathedral, and yes, with lots of boxes to push, along with a plethora of constrict puzzles, where the object is to turn things by running in circles around them. The first section are the caves themselves, and I love the attention to detail in making the rock walls of the cave the same bluish color they have in Blood Omen. This area is all about finding the means to open a massive metal door found near the cave's entrance, which leads to the oracle chambers we see in Blood Omen, recreated in wonderful detail, with Raziel speaking of Kane's first meeting with Mobius. I would have loved to see Mobius' museum here as well, and it's definitely a missed opportunity. But where in Blood Omen this is the final room of the caverns, in Soul Reaver the next step is to shift the walls and open a path below to different sublevels and more puzzles and the statue of Mobius himself, where Raziel gives some commentary how the time streamer doesn't seem as intimidating as Kane's stories of his exploits would have them believe, but that even in statue form, the man does radiate some form of authority. The compound below the Oracle Chambers is linked to time and time streaming with several alcoves showing pre-rendered cutscenes of events past and potential future. Many of these are in fact actual cut elements from the original plot. At the end is the Chronoplast Chamber, 
where Cain awaits. Taunting Raziel, and when the prodigal son once shouts in outrage at Cain's immoral acts, in this occasion the raising of the Seraphim warriors, which Raziel now claims were heroes, trying to rid Nosgoth of the corruption vampires represent, Cain mocks him for his simplistic view of things, stating that Seraphim or vampire, their goal was the same, control and domination. This second battle is identical to the first. The player needs to strike Cain three times. Only difference is that Cain starts on the ground level of the chamber, then with each hit he appears one level above, forcing the player to run and jump before Cain can blast you with lightning. Fortunately, and strangely, standing in the center of the room regenerates your life energy completely. There's a healing pad, so there really isn't any way to fail, other than from frustration perhaps. Every time Cain is struck, a cutscene plays as he manipulates some part of the chronoplast machinery. With the last hit, he appears before a portal, claiming Raziel nearly had him, but that this was not where it ended, and jumps through the gate. The Elder God warns Raziel that to follow would mean going outside of his reach, but Raziel won't be deterred and jumps into the portal. The warning is curious, because in Soul Reaver 2, when Raziel reaches the Elder God, the creature recognizes him and it's clear that his awareness exists outside of time. Perhaps he means his omnipotence. In Soul Reaver, the Elder God can communicate with Raziel across all of Nosgoth, while in the sequels, they only speak when they're in close proximity to each other. In fact, in Soul Reaver 2, Raziel implies that as things get worse in Nosgoth, the Elder God seems to thrive, and is in fact bigger and more far-reaching physically in more recent time periods than in the far-flung past. Could just be that in Soul Reaver, the Elder God's tendrils reach everywhere. The last scene of Soul Reaver has Raziel land in some sort of limbo, with Mobius appearing before him. Raziel, Redeemer and Destroyer, Pawn and Messiah, welcome, time span soul. Welcome to your destiny. He says, before a cryptic message appears on screen warning, perhaps of Mobius' intentions, followed by a to-be-continued message. But that's not what the original plan was. The confrontation in the Chronoplast Chamber would have been the second of three Cain fights, and at the end of it, Raziel would take a fragment of Cain's soul and gain the power to shift at will between realms. The next step would have been the Human Citadel, home to both the normal humans I mentioned, and a sect of fanatical vampire-worshipping cultists, with a hidden temple in the Undercity, a secret section of the Citadel where they would drag kidnapped folk from above to use in their rituals. This cult is even mentioned in Soul Reaver's manual, despite not being there in the retail version. The Undercity section would end with Raziel killing and consuming the soul of the priestess of the cult, gaining the ability to possess others, much like the control spells in Blood Omen. Afterwards, Raziel would travel to the smokestack, seen briefly in the opening cinematic, described as an industrial area meant to spew fumes into the air to weaken the effects of the sun, so that vampires could be around in the day. This was to be Turel's territory, and consuming his soul would have granted an enhanced projectile, similar to how his soul grants full telekinesis in Defiance. From the top of the smokestack, Raziel could reach Cain's Mountain Retreat, but would have to consume Ariel's soul first as she informs him that doing so is the only way for the Reaver to gain enough power to vanquish Cain. It does so and finally destroys his enemy, gorging on Cain's soul and obtaining the empowered Soul Reaver of a deep crimson color. Lastly, from the mountain retreat, he'd glide to the sealed top of the cathedral, where he would fight an onslaught of vampires before opening the last set of pipes and allowing the cathedral to fulfill its intended function, killing all vampires on Nosgoth. At the end, he would be congratulated by the Elder God, and Raziel would realize, in horror, he'd been a pawn to the Eldritch creature, and that destroying the vampires had in fact devastating consequences for Nosgoth. He would then use the Chronoplast Chamber to head into the past to change history, in a theoretical sequel. With that said, Amy Hennig has stated that the way things played out, with it to be continued, was something of a blessing in disguise, as it opened up much more interesting story options for the sequels. And I have to agree, as cool as some of those cut elements sound, particularly the smokestack and the cathedral top, it's the twisty, topsy-turvy nature of the sequel stories that makes the Legacy of Kane series so compelling. There would be a much different tone to Soul Reaver 2 if the journey was about Raziel correcting his mistakes rather than his dogged pursuit of Kane 
leading him to find out so many interesting mysteries. But thus ends Soul Reaver, the game that very much put the series on the map. Blood Omen, though successful, sold, according to some court documents from 2011, about 320,000 units in its lifetime. But by 2001, only two years, Soul Reaver had already sold over 1.5 million. And this is by far the most successful entry in the entire Legacy of Kane series. While I prefer Blood Omen's vast open world full of places to explore and things to find, Soul Reaver was my entry into the series, and Raziel is one hell of a protagonist. Next time, we'll be looking at the sequel, the one that does a lot of the heavy lifting in the Crystal Dynamics Legacy of Kane narrative, Soul Reaver 2. After that, it's the game we all love to hate, Blood Omen 2, before ending with the last main entry into the series, Defiance. Thanks for joining me, and I will see you on the next one.